down into Dr. Uh, Greg Halich. Uh, Greg is a University of Kentucky Econ uh, specialist, and he's going to be talking today about uh, strategies, strategies to reduce fertilizer costs on cattle farms. So I'm going to turn it over to Greg, and he's going to talk a little bit about the efficiencies with uh, the process that we have with the fertilization. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Is this, is this something you're interested in hearing? Would you all like to reduce your fertilizer use a little bit? All right, maybe even eliminate it. What if you could eliminate it? Maybe not on all the farm, but at least the pasture starting there. Got some people are skeptical, and that's fine. So by the way, I always tell people be skeptical, not just now, but if you're a farmer like me, if you're not skeptical, guess what's gonna happen about a year from now? You can be out of money, right? Uh, so be skeptical, but I also like to say have an open mind, because you can hopefully do both simultaneously, right? By the way, if you only do one or the other, it doesn't really matter which one, is probably also not a good thing. So be skeptical, have an open mind, ask questions as we go along. Is that fair enough? All right. Um, so the, the first thing I'm going to do is just show us, kind of put context to the problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back before fertilizer prices start increasing, so spring of 2021, look at where they were then. Look at where they were last spring. We'll talk a little bit about where they're about now, um, kind of at the very end. And then once we do that, then I want to do, I want to give more context to it to show you what that means on both a per cow basis, kind of with typical management, if you're using a lot of fertilizer, and then look at what that means for the whole farm for a 50 cow farm, just for context. So let's start out by looking at where the fertilizer price are before we had the run ups in 2021, and then we'll look at 2022. So there's 2021, spring 2021, on, with both a per ton on a per ton basis, the raw fertilizer, and then if you convert it over to per unit basis, and, and for the DAP, that's subtracting out essentially the nitrogen value. So however you want to look at that, I've got them both there. There's spring 2022. Again, depending on how you want to look at it, I'm going to, I'm going to look at a per unit basis. Basically, the nitrogen went up two and a half times, right? The potassium went up a little bit more than double, and the phosphorus, like 40%. Um, and by the way, which, which, which nutrients are most important generally for forage production out of the three, unfortunately? The nitrogen, potassium, right? So we're basically over double from where we were. Uh, so let's put it on context. So on a per acre basis, I'm going to do this for both hay ground and then pasture, and then we'll, we'll lump it all together in terms of the farm. Um, I had to make assumptions here for both uh, hay and pasture. Again, I'm assuming here this is a, a farm that relies heavily on commercial fertilizer. Um, so I'm not saying this is what I recommend. I'm just saying I'm, I'm trying to kind of show you probably on average where, where most farms in Kentucky are. So I'm assuming that this is on a per acre basis, so 60 units of nitrogen, so what about 130 pounds of urea, 30 units of potassium, or phosphorus, and, and 100 units of potassium. What does that add up to on a per acre basis? Almost 150 bucks. Um, what about pasture? And again, I'm not saying this is what I recommend. In fact, this is not what I recommend. I, I would say in pasture, you're crazy if you're putting down nitrogen every year, even, at, even in 2021. Um, but if on average someone's doing this, what does that work out to? About 90 bucks an acre. All right, so let's put it on a per cow basis. So I'm going to make two assumptions. I'm going to assume that you're on average going to need about 0.8 acres of hay ground. That would, on a three ton yield, that would be about two and a half tons of hay per cow. Uh, so that would work out to about, a. this is just fertilizer costs. This doesn't include fuel, doesn't include labor, repairs, anything, just fertilizer. Be clear, so $115 per cow. And here's pasture, and here I'm assuming two acres of pasture per cow. Uh, that works out to about 175 bucks per cow. And if you add those together, we're just about at two, about $300 per cow, just in fertilizer cost. Do we have a little problem here? A, a little problem. Um, and by the way, final context, putting it on a 50-acre or 50-cow farm, what does that work out to? About $14,000. Now, I would have argued, so I, I don't have the calculation here, but even if we use 2021 fertilizer price, I think that worked out at about $6,000 total for that farm. I would have argued even in 2021, if you're relying heavily on commercial fertilizer, you're pr pretty much trading away all the potential, and I say potential profit of that farm for what? The convenience of using that commercial fertilizer. 2022, you're trading away a little bit more than 
just the potential profitability long run. So we have a problem here, what can we do about it? Um, and that's what we're gonna focus on the rest of this presentation. Um, and basically I'm gonna give you five different strategies to either reduce or, I'm, I hate to even say eliminate, but some farms probably even potentially in the right circumstance even eliminate fertilizer use on a cow-calf operation. Uh, and this slide of answer is a little bit temperamental, so be close. All right, so strategy number one, and this, is, this should be the most obvious, and I, I'm, I'm really not gonna focus on it except for one thing, just to, to show you the cost side. And that's, at least for our nitrogen, which was our biggest real user, how can we use legumes? How can we incorporate that um, rather than relying on commercial fertilizer? What I'm gonna focus on, I'm not gonna tell you how to get a good clover stand. You've got other speakers that, that are doing that. What I'm gonna do is two things. One is, is focus on the cost to make sure you understand what are, if you're using commercial fertilizer, what is that costing you compared to a legume-based system, a clover-based system? Uh, and at the very end, I'm gonna show you one legume that I think is, is highly underutilized in Kentucky, particularly with high fertilizer price. So I'm gonna do this essentially twice. First time is with commercial nitrogen, and then we'll do the same thing for a clover-based system. And what we're gonna to try to do is, what does it cost you to get an additional ton of forage using commercial fertilizer and, and trying to use legumes? Does that make sense? And you'll see what I mean as we go through this. So this is back in 2021, that's when, so I'm gonna start there, we'll look at 2022. So at 2021 prices, that's 40 cents a unit for the nitrogen. Let's assume we're putting down 50 units, so what, about 110, 106 pounds a urea, something like that. So we'd have about $40 per acre in the raw end cost. $6 to apply it, spreading charge, that gives us a total investment of $26 an acre. Uh, now, what we have to do now is figure out what additional production are we gonna get by, by putting that end down. So I'm gonna start with, with what I think is absolute best case scenario, then we're gonna go to what I think is probably more typical. So if everything goes right, uh, we might get about 60, a 60 to one response. In other words, every unit of nitrogen, we get about 60 pounds of production. This would be just for spring, not late summer. Uh, you would never get that. But if everything went ideal, you'd, you'd get about 3,000 pounds of production, which would be how many tons? Because we're gonna convert this one and a half tons, right? So what we're gonna do is we're now gonna divide the total cost per acre by the additional tons per acre. That will give us our cost per ton. So let's do that very quickly. So we divide that 26 by 1.5. And so essentially our cost in 2021 prices was about $17 per ton of extra forage produce. Make sense? Now that's if everything goes ideally. What if, if we get more typical situation for maybe, maybe a 40 to one response in the spring? That the math is easy, that comes out to what? 2,000 pounds, one ton. So we divide our $26 by one ton and we now have a cost of what? $26 a ton. And remember, that's a 2021 price. We'll look at later on what, I don't want to scare you too badly right now. So let's start there. All right, let's do the same thing with clover. Um, and let's assume that we're gonna, we're essentially gonna seed every three years on average. So I'm gonna, this is just an example. You could have other ones. So I'm gonna put down five pounds of red clover at 320 a pound. Uh, that gives us $16 an acre. One pound of ladino clover, $5 a pound and then that same $6 application or, or spreading charge. So we have $27 invest in that, but it's gonna be every three years, right? So we divide that by three to prorate it, that comes out at $9 an acre. Now we've gotta do the same thing where we're gonna, we need to figure out what extra production are we gonna get. Now the, to me, the big difference here is with commercial nitrogen in the spring, potential, especially, we have a pretty good idea of what we're gonna get when we put that down. With clover, there's a, a much wider range, right? Why is that? A lot of it deals with your management, right? How, how well are you able to get that, that clover established? How, how well with your grazing management on pastures at least are you, is that gonna do kind of throughout the year? So I'm giving you a wide range of, of production over on the left. And I should update this with Ray, but I, I, I asked Ray this probably about eight years ago or better in terms of with typical management, what would he expect to get extra in terms of just a, a plain grass pasture? And so you could, we can update this now, Ray, but at, at that time you told me somewhere in that three quarters to one and a quarter ton of extra forage production. But you, haven't, you, know, you can pick anything that you want there in terms of your situation. So what I'm gonna do now is, is 
put down all the costs per ton on the right. Again, you can kind of pick whichever one you think is, is applicable, but I'm highlighting the, the range that, that kind of Ray thought was, was most typical. So think about those, compare that to the, what, the $26 on the, the grass, or on the commercial nitrogen side. We'll come back to that. By the way, if you have kind of really good at um, management of that clover stand, I think you can do better, probably one and a half tons. Doesn't change that cost per ton a whole lot, though, once you get in that range. So what I'm going to do now is kind of put everything in table format. So on the right-hand side is, is what we just came up with for the clover-based system in terms of cost per ton. On the, the second column from the left, that's what we came up with for the, the commercial nitrogen at 2021 prices. Now what I'm going to do, so very quickly, if we just look at, say, the one-ton extra forage production, what is the cost difference between the 2021 commercial nitrogen and the clover-based system? About three to one, right? It costs about three times the amount to use that commercial fertilizer, commercial nitrogen at 2021 prices. You all ready for me to put in the 2022 prices? So I would say it's already getting out of hand at, at this, this difference right here, three to one. And if we look at 2022, we're now at what? Six to one cost difference. Do we have a problem there maybe? A little, little bit. By the way, this is assuming the extra forage production is, is the same value. I don't think it is. Would you rather have extra one ton of clover production or one ton of fescue production in the spring? I think we all, all know the answer. So in other words, I'm not even accounting for that, right? We're just saying raw production. Um, so again, I think it was already ridiculous in 2021. At 2022, the question I have is why on earth is anyone doing this? And that's the next question. Why are we still doing this? Any ideas? I agree. So number one, tradition, it's, it's easier, right? One call in the spring, late March, early April, basically we got it done, right? And, and that's absolutely true. And, and when I do the long list, I put that in terms of it's, it's a whole lot easier. I would lump that in with tradition, and, which is probably why we're, we've been doing it traditionally, right? It's just a lot easier. And it does take a lot better management, uh, at least initially, to kind of get in the mode where you, can, you, you know how to get that good clover stand. You can do it consistently. So absolutely tradition. Uh, a second one. I would say is more of a structural. I'm condensing this into just two, and that's what I'm calling it. It's a tr there's a transition period. So if you've been heavy, heavily relying on commercial nitrogen and you try to go to a legume-based system, clover-based system, are you going to get the extra production right away? No. Best case scenario, even if, if you do a great job of getting it, so let's say you go out and you, brought, you, you do frost seeding here in the next couple months, even if you get a good establishment, are you going to get a lot of extra production this first year? No, if best case scenario, if you have really good late summer rains, you'll have some late summer extra production and, and going into fall. But, but most likely, it's going to be two years before you get really that, that boost in production. That's if everything goes right. If, if you have trouble getting that clover stand established, because again, that does take a little bit different management, it may be two or three years, right? So I think that's a big impediment for a lot of people. In other words, they try it maybe once or twice. It doesn't work quite as they, they thought. And they, they go back to what? Tradition what worked for years and years, but at a cost, right? As you see, as, at a big cost. So what I'm going to do now is just show you one tool, one legume that, that I don't think we use nearly enough here in Kentucky that can get you through that transition period, and that's annual lespedeza. Who here uses annual lespedeza? Just two of you. Have you had good success using it? I've been using it for about 13, 14 years. It took me a while to kind of figure it out. And that's a whole that's a 45 minute presentation on how to manage it well, how to establish it well. But assuming you can you you get to know how to do that, I think it's a wonderful legume, especially on low fertility sites or in a situation where you've had good production, but you've had good production because you've been putting down a lot of commercial fertilizer. That lesbides, in my experience, is a wonderful legume for that. Is, would you both agree on that? So good. So let's look at a few slides here. This is kind of typically where you're going to see it used. So you're going to see it into existing pasture. This is mid, or I'm sorry, mid July. This was on, and just to give you the context here, this was a rental farm that was adjacent to one of my farms. Uh, was good soil, but it had been hayed for at least 10 to 15 years, and and knowing the farmer, probably very little put down. So uh, good soil, but not not very good fertility. And the, the fescue kind of struggled. Um, I think actually, so Chris Toit said something about 
<clears throat> if the grass is struggling, you can put down a little nitrogen to thick it up, right? Well, if the grass is struggling, annual Espadizo, I can assure you, will work wonderfully. Would that be your experiences? If the grass is really competing hard in the spring or, or early summer, it will choke it out. So you don't want to use it in that situation. But where the fertility is, is subpar, where the grass is struggling, the annual Espadizo will do extremely well in that situation. And that's what you're looking at there. If we zoom in on that, that's essentially what that stand looked like in mid-July. Now that is above average stand historically, but that is kind of the potential for me in, in, um, in that perennial pasture. And you'll get good production until what, late August or so, right? Until when it starts wanting to set seed in, in early September. Um, so what are some advantages of it? We've, we've kind of talked about, works very well with marginal fertility soils, or again, we're, we're the only way you've gotten good production is with a lot of commercial fertilizer use. If you stop using that commercial fertilizer, the grass struggles, annual espadies will work very good in that situation. Um, it also, bro IELTS broadcasts, I know some people that drill it, do you all broadcast it? Do you broadcast it or drill? Okay, it broadcasts just like clover. But you, you don't want to do it as early as you do clover, at least my experience, because it's a warm season legume. If that germinates and you get temperatures down in, in the high 20s, it will kill it out. And I've learned that the hard way. Um, it wasn't years, anyways. So don't seed it, in my opinion, at least until mid-March. The perfect window is probably March 20th to March 25th, somewhere in there. But you can't have perfect, you know, you got to go a little bit on either side of that. Um, and the best thing is you are getting most of your production basically in July and August, when typically your pastures are what? At their worst, right? So another good advantage of this. Unfortunately, this year it's, it's doubled in price. So I've talked to some seed suppliers, so you guys have looked at it. It's still, I'm still gonna use it, even though it's doubled in price, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut down on, on my application rate, and there's probably a couple areas I won't seed it. Um, but apparently most of this is grown in Missouri. The seed, not for seed. And I've got a good friend in southern Missouri, uh, and they got hammered by drought this last year. So that's my guess why it, it doubled in price. So typically, it will, it will go back down when, if they have a good crop. But I'm still going to use it this year, even though it's about double the price. Um, good question. So if, if you look at recommended guides, they'll say like 20 to 30 pounds. If it's free and you're spending someone else's money, use 20 to 30 pounds. If you're spending your own money and if, if you're buying it this year, Typically on perennial pasture, I'll use no more than eight pounds to the acre. Uh, and if I'm mixing in clover with it, I'll go as low as five pounds. Uh, but, but typically by itself, around eight pounds. This year, I'm probably gonna go five to six pounds because of the price. Um, so the other way that you can use it, and this was actually the first place in Kentucky that I've ever seen this done, but we used to have millions of acres just like this here in Kentucky every year that we'd plant. And that was to essentially uh, especially pasture and hay. So th this is basically a pure stand of Elf or Lespedeza. It, it was in crop ground before this. This was after the first grain boom that, that we had. This farm is an integrated um, cattle uh, grain operation. So they had a lot of land that they put into uh, grain production during between 2008 and 2012 that they took out after that marginal ground. And so I was working with them on bale grazing, and they told me they wanted to take that out of row crops. And, and so I suggested, you know, why don't you try annual Lesbadiza there for a year, see how it does. Um, I just figured it would do well, and, and based on everything I'd read, I figured, it, anyway, so this is the first one I saw, about a 30-acre uh, stand. Does it look pretty good to you? That, that was with about 10 to 12 pounds the acre on that particular year. Uh, there are a few weeds, so they didn't apply herbicide, and I don't know which you'd apply, but if, if you, nine out of ten times, if you'd have zoomed in on that anywhere, that stand looked like about that. That was early July. The nice thing about in a pure stand is it will mature about a, two weeks earlier because it has no competition. So in other words, that would take at least mid-July in that perennial grass stand to get to kind of that height. Um, so a little bit earlier production. Um, I came back about 10 days later, so that was very beginning of July. I came back 10, so about mid-July, call it. That's what that stand looked like. Um, it's about at 20 inches of forage. They actually got away from, they should have cut the bulk of it for hay at that time. So they had gone through about a, a half of the 30 acres grazing it, and they should have cut the rest for hay because the very beginning was getting ready to, to be about the right height again. They didn't. Um, 
But in other words, you can also make hay out of this. And that's what the bulk, when we planted two million acres, the bulk of that was cut for hay in Kentucky. Makes incredible, it's an alfalfa like uh, hay. That same farm on two other, uh, essentially two other areas where they converted back from row crops to perennial pasture, they did that uh, two other fields, uh, different fields, same farm. And that was two other times they had stands just like that where it got over 20 inches. Uh, works great in that when it's its own, and you can mix other things with this but if, if you want, but it makes a really good specialty pasture or hay crop ground. It's an annual. It's annual SBDs. There are two types, Korean and Kobe. Korean is the most common one. Uh, so it will reseed itself sometimes very well, it, uh, especially if, if you get off it in, in late uh, August. It will start setting seeds. So if you get off it and let it set seed, it will typically reseed itself fairly well. But you can't depend on it to, to do it every year. Other questions there? Good question. I'm not going to say you'll never have an animal bloat, but I've never heard of any, and all the literature says it's essentially, yeah. I've killed at least three or four steers on, on clover-based pastures. I've never killed anything here. And if, if an ag econ is gonna, person is going to kill animals, I can do it. So, All right, other questions there? Let me say one more thing. I call, I call annual lesbidiza a bridge legume, at least on perennial pasture, because once you build up the fertility of that perennial pasture uh, where the grass is starting to be vigorous, it won't grow there very well by itself anymore. And that's good, right? Because in other words, it's done its job. It's restored fertility, and the grass and clover can, can kind of take over at that time. It, it depends on, you know, the fertility of the pasture, et cetera. If it's poor fertility, my, my experience is I have a hard time getting ladinal clover to do well until the fertility is built up. Red clover will do a lot better in that marginal. So typically I will, I will mix in some red clover, maybe three pounds three or four pounds when I do the annual SBS. You won't see it that first year. Red clover is very tolerant to, to not a lot of light. And so that next year, in fact, I'll show you a picture later on related to something else where red clover mixed into that lesbidiza did very well on that second year. All right, strategy number two, and, and this, this is essentially a two-slide summary of a 45-minute presentation. So you're not going to get any detail here. It's just kind of food for thought, if that makes sense. So strategy number two, feed hay to essentially either retain or recycle nutrients. Now, there are two ways that I know how to do this very effectively. One is by what we're looking at right there, and that's bale grazing. Who here has is, is either heard of or done bale grazing? Excellent. We've got a couple... By the way, if I asked that question five years ago, I'd pretty well guarantee you that neither of your hands would have been up. Am I correct? All right. So it is spreading. Um, I'm not going to talk very much about it, but this is what it looks like before the, the cattle go through the, that, those bales. The other way that you, you can do the same in terms of nutrient retention or recycling is, is unrolling hay. Unrolling hay will work just as well as bale grazing, but again, I'm giving you two slide pr or summary but you're going to have a lot of additional costs to unrolling hay that you will not have with bale grazing. So I'm a huge advocate of bale grazing. I've been doing it personally for about 13 years now, um, and I love it. Um, so I'm probably biased. So talk to these two guys. If, if you are interested in bale grazing, talk to two people who have just been doing it for a while. They'll, they'll give you the real scoop, right, hopefully. All right, so if you do a good job, I'm going to show you what this, essentially this pasture will look like after you go through bale grazing, and that's what it looked look like. Does it look like you got pretty good nutrient distribution there? Now, they did everything right. It was dry, so it's not always going to look that pretty, but it can look that good, and I've seen a lot of farms that, that have looked that good when they're done bale grazing. Um, so a couple quick questions. What would the fertilizer value of that be? Any guesses? I'll give you a couple of scenarios. Uh, if, if you fed it a lower density, what I call two tons of hay to the acre, and if, if we assume 75% of the nutrients get recycled back into the pasture, that essentially is what you'd be looking at in terms of units of fertilizer. Pretty good dose of fertility on a pasture, right? If you fed it a higher density, which I actually don't recommend, at four tons the acre, 
we're, we're now approaching what you'd probably need for long-term hay production, right? Um, now, five years ago, or six, we'll call it six years ago, I would not have had this question here. But the question I have is, what do you think the biological value of that type of hay feeding would be? And unrolling would be the same. And by that I mean, what are you getting with this type of hay feeding that we, you would not be getting with commercial N, P, and K? Worms, but before the worms use it. What, so if we do commercial N, P, and K, we're, we're spreading out granules, right? With no organic matter essentially to them, right? We're getting organic matter with this feeding system, right? The dung and also the, the waste hay. Um, now again, this is, and I'm going to talk more about the biological component later on in a few other contexts. But again, six years ago, I, that would not have even been on my radar screen. But today, I think the actual value to feed the biology in this situation is probably more than the NP and K, the value of the NP and K that I'm getting. Don't know that for sure, but that's my hypothesis. And we are going to test this. We, I'm leading a, a six-state bale grazing grant. Those are the states involved. And we are, that's one of the questions we're going to look at. We're, Alan Franz Lubers from North Carolina, um, he is going to be looking at that specific component, the biological component, to the soil side. Um, and we're looking at forage production. We also are looking at, at raw N, P, and K changes over time, all those different things. Uh, but hopefully we'll, we'll be able to answer that question at some point during, <coughs> during this project. Um, by the way, if you're interested in bale grazing, and if you're interested in being part of this project, we're looking <coughs> for farms for the next five winters, essentially. So contact your county agent. Strategy number three. Um, and that's using weeds to feed biology. So we talked about potentially using hay feeding to feed the biology. What about using weeds to feed biology? Again, six years ago, I, would, I wouldn't be saying this. I want you, and so this, I want you to all get out of your com comfort zone here. I want you to kind of think about other things. So I want to be clear, though. I'm not, saying I want you, <clears throat> I'm not saying that I want you to have weedy pastures or hay ground. It's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that weeds are usually a symptom of some type of problem. I'm not going to say 100% of the time, but I will say probably 90% of the time that it's either a fertility problem, a management problem, or some combination of those two. And until you figure out what those problems are and correct it, guess what? The, what even if you spray those weeds, guess what's going to happen? They'll come back, right? So that's what I'm talking about here. I'm not saying I want you to have long-term weed, weed issues. I'm saying I want you to figure out how to correct them. But in the meantime, because it's usually not going to be instantaneously, in the meantime, Use those weeds, clip them when they're vegetative. Don't wait till they're mostly carbon. Clip them when they're vegetative. Um, and those weeds can feed bi the biology in that pasture or hay ground. Now, I'm going to read you a quote here because this will help you better understand exactly what I mean by this. And so this is by Sir Albert Howard. He was a British agriculturalist in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, so what he said is the destruction of a pest is the evasion of rather than the solution of all agricultural problems. Now, I think he was probably a little strong in his wording, but if I change it slightly, and if I, if I change that to most agricultural problems, that's what I would essentially say. What is he trying to say? Because he wrote this, what, 75 years ago, and, and we talk a little bit differently now. So I'm going to paraphrase. I'll tell you what I think he's trying to say, um, and you can kind of put in your own words. But I think what he was trying to say is, if you shoot the messenger before you receive the message, you're never going to have a chance at correcting those underlying problems. And I'm not saying there's not a, a place to spray weeds. There are, and I have before. But if you don't figure out what the underlying problem is and you just spray the weeds, those weeds, I promise you, they will be back. It may be a couple years, but they will be back. And if you spray them enough, by the way, what's, what are you going to be dealing with then? You're going to be dealing with, with weeds that are starting to get resistance to what you're spraying with them. So that is what I'm saying. Figure out what the problem is, correct it, the underlying root cause of that problem. In the meantime, Use those weeds to advantage because they will feed the soil biology. Strategy number four. And by the way, this is probably the single number one problem that I see driving all over the state, working with farmers, more so just seeing the farms that I drive by. Uh, that most farms that I see, well over 50% of the cattle farms are, are what I'd call overstocked. Probably half of those that are overstocked are severely overstocked. And again, this is a two-slide summary of a bigger presentation. But being overstocked, I can almost guarantee you, you're going to have a whole cascading list of other problems once you're over at that overstock level that you're going to be dealing with every single year. Um, so we're not going to talk about all that. I'm just going to kind of give you a summary of probably where most farms in Kentucky want to be. 
And so, by the way, I never answer this question directly. So if someone says, how many acres of pasture should I have per cow? I never answer that directly because it, it depends a whole lot on what? Quality of your soil, where it's at right now, and also your management. So I answer indirectly in terms of how many days should you typically be feeding. It will average year, or will vary year to year. But on average, how many days should you be feeding cows in Kentucky? And this would be for a commercial cow-calf farm. If, if you sell breeding stock that's a that's whole, whole lot higher value, it's going to be different. Uh, but for a typical commercial cow-calf farm in Kentucky, this is, this is typically where, where you're going to want to be, somewhere between 60, two to three months of hay feeding. If you're feeding a lot more than that, if you're feeding a, more than 120 days of hay feeding, average per year, I can pretty well guarantee you, you're going to be struggling. You're, you're probably on longer and not going to have a chance of making a profit on that farm if you're selling it at commercial you know, stockyards prices. Uh, so we're not spending much time, but that is the quickest way to, to essentially reduce your fertilizer use. Because if you're overstocked, I'm pretty well guarantee you're using cumulatively a lot of fer fertilizer, particularly on the hay ground, right? Because you're going to be feeding a lot of hay. All right. Um, so I'm going to do a quick case study, and that's going to lead to the fifth strategy that I'm going to bring up here tonight. Um, so this is one example. It's, it's not a scientific analysis. It's case study. But case studies can, can prove helpful to get us thinking, right? So that's all my intent is to do is get you thinking here. So this is the second farm that, that I bought in southern Woodford County. Um, and I'll explain the background on it, and you'll see how poor it was when it started. And just by doing some of these management changes that we've talked about tonight, how quickly you can turn around a farm like that without using one pound of commercial fertilizer, which I didn't here. Now, I did. I used lime on half of it. Now, I was going to the whole thing needed lime, but after I put down lime on half it, I stopped because I wanted to know what what was due to the lime, what was due to the other things. So just to be fair and give you a heads up on all that before I forget and, and don't say anything later on. All right, so the history of this for at least 25 years, uh, and that was three years ago now, but the previous 25 years before that, that had been used pretty much strictly for hay production. Uh, and the reason I know this is because my next door neighbor, who at the time was 87 years old, so he's 80 or close to 90 now, uh, he was the last person to have cattle on that farm. And that was roughly 25 years. And, and he said been hayed continuously by a different farmer since. Um, so what you're seeing there, and so this was first winter. It was February 29th. It was a leap year um, when I took that picture. And I had bale grass, so I, I put cattle on in the fall, late fall. And I basically was bale grazing around the farm. And this was roughly, ha I'd been, I was roughly halfway through at that point. What you see there is accu accumulated growth since mid-June. So that farmer, the previous farmer took up one cutting hay mid-June or so. I was supposed to get the farm later that summer. It was during COVID. It didn't work out you know, from the, the seller side, who I know very well. But anyway, so miscommunication, he, he just didn't do anything from that point. So that's accumulated growth from mid-September into winter. Does that look like a productive farm? It looks piss poor, right? So again, I bale grazed through that, that whole farm uh, one winter. And then what I'm going to show you now is a series of pictures over the next two years, starting with the first spring. So typically by May 3rd, hopefully on your farm, you've got really peak growth, right, by, by May 3rd. Does this look like peak growth to you? So by the way, all these pictures you see are going to be when I go into pasture, not when the cattle have been there for, for a week or something. Uh, I can see pretty well down to two inches there, and I, I almost can see the ground, right? That's about as poor. I knew I was going to have low production that first year, but I was unprepared at how poor that production was. This farm was used to getting heavy dose of urea in the spring. It did not get it, and it basically didn't know how to grow without that, that urea, quite simply. Um, I'm going to show you the picture on May 6th. That, the reason I'm showing you this picture is I was still feeding hay. I had to still feed hay at that time. The pasture was that bad. That was the last bale I fed, so I was probably gone by May 9th, which I'm, is going to be important because I'm going to show you May 9th the next year, just to show you the difference in it later on. So start looking at these pictures. Again, every time you see a, a picture, the cattle, the, the cattle obviously have been in where the hay is, but everything else is, is where they haven't been. You can see a lot of weeds there, right? So I'll just show a series of pictures. So here's early June. Again, a lot of weeds. I can assure you that the weed production was far in excess of the grass production on this farm. Um, 
mid or early July. So I, I like to joke that looks like really good pollinator habitat. I probably should have signed up with NRCS for $50 an acre or something like that. My mistake, um, but sometimes that happens. Right? But you can see it, it, it was pretty weedy, right? Not just pretty, it was, it was terrible. I could not, but basically by this time I was doing what though in the cattle, when the cattle came through, were finished for the pasture, what was I starting to do? I was clipping those pastures. Convert that, those weeds into, bi into biological food. And so I was religious about that until everything was clipped in that first cycle. Here's July 16th, still a lot of weeds. This was the last set of pastures that I clipped, so a week later everything was clipped there. Um, but by mid-July, guess, guess what I had growing well on this farm? Annual Espediza. And I guarantee you, I mean, I would bet 100 bucks that those cattle right now are, are eating what? Annual Espediza. That's the only thing that grew well on that farm. If, if it wasn't for Annual Espediza, I would have had to literally cut my stocking rate in half by that time. That, it saved me. Here's the second winter. So I bale grazed essentially about the same number of bales that second winter. So in terms of raw NP and cake in chemical format, I applied about the same amount both winters. That sound, so just help you understand what's going on. What I want you to see now is how, how much it changed though from the first uh, May to the second May. So in other words, would you all agree production was poor that first year? All right, so what I'm gonna do now, and by the way, you can see where a bale was actually fed there, can't you? It was right in the middle of broom sedge and it didn't 100% eradicate that broom sedge, but did, a, did it do a pretty good job at it? Pretty good. All right, so the next picture is on May 9th, 2021. Do you all remember what it looked like on May 6th the previous year? All right, so you're ready for what it looked like one year later? Does it look like it improved a little bit? Now we'll come back and, and talk about why it may have been that drastic from the first year to the second year, and I'll, I'll tell you, but think about why that may have happened. Again, I didn't, use, I didn't use a single pound of commercial fertilizer. Now, did I use fertilizer? Yeah, I used a lot of fertilizer, feeding those bales through the cattle, distributing it back on the pasture. Yeah, I, I fed over the, the only part I didn't feed very much, and, and we're, not, we're not looking on any of the pictures, there was an area that was cropped heavily on the top, the best soil on the farm, which was where that picture I showed of the, the Ford power workmaster with the weeds. Uh, that was actually, um, that's a whole nother thing. That's, I'm not showing any pictures from that because that was kind of managed separately. And I didn't want to feed hay up there that had, um, uh, that had cool season grass heads in it because I, I don't, I, that's going to be, a, that is a warm season pasture up there. So I didn't want, so I, I had to be careful of that. So I didn't feed that. But yes, on all the pasture, it was, I, I, I fed it about as consistently in terms of tons per acre as I could. It was roughly two tons to the acre over the whole farm, both, both winters. Maybe just slightly under that, but, but close to it. Is that a good place? Yes. That's what I tell, started about two tons an acre, do not go above that unless you're doing it in the fall, like last year would have been a good time in the, when it was dry to feed at higher densities if you needed to. But if you do that in the winter and it's wet like it typically is, like if you'd been doing that last week, you would have, you'd have a whole lot more pugging than you'd want to look at. That, that is the 45 minute presentation to go in those details. Uh, so let's talk about why, why we had this dramatic of a transformation. So two more pictures later that year. So there's kind of high summer. That someone asked about the clover broadcasting. Who asked about that? So again, I I, pro, I don't remember. I actually have good records. I could tell you exactly what I put. But probably about three to four pounds of red clover I mixed in with the annual Espediza. And I would say on about a third of the farm I had clover that looked about like that. Yes, broad, broadcast that with the Espediza. Yep. Um, and then uh, late fall, that's what it looked like there. Now we did have, we had good fall rains that year, I remember it, but I'm willing to bet that I had, I grew more grass in the fall that year than the whole year before. And I think you would all agree just looking at the pictures. All right, so here's that first May, and, and this is why I think, you, and again, I don't know this for sure, this is my hypothesis, we're gonna look at this over the five year study that we're doing. But my guess is the soil biology was barely functioning that first spring because essentially it was addicted to what? It was addicted to, to urea. Uh, in that second year, now it wasn't perfect, and, and as good as this looks, this was two weeks behind the farm that I've been bale grazing for over, at, well at that time, about 11 years or so. It was two full weeks behind, but it was still in, you know, an incredible transformation from the year before. But, so I'm not gonna say it was perfect, but soil biology was what? 
my, and, and my gut feeling is it was starting to kick in. I had primed that soil biology so it was starting to function. Um, and that's why I think you had that radical transformation. Now I'm going to show you a little bit of science behind that. And, and this is still developing. And this, by the way, is, is by Alan Franz Lubers. He's, he's leading the soil component in this bale grazing grant. Uh, and he's done some really innovative work related to, to soil biological activity, uh, both in pastures. He's also done some on row crops, on, on corn. But his specialty has been pastures so far. So let me tell you what's going on here. So on the left-hand axis, that's a, a test that he does to measure soil biological activity. Don't worry about the numbers, just the bigger the number, the, the more biological activity that you have. Think of that as more of an index for your purposes. On the bottom is, is nitrogen mineralization. So in other words, as organic matter breaks down, it's going to mineralize, mineralize nitrogen. And so we'll, we'll look at that in a second. So first of all, does it look like there's a good correlation between how much biology is, how the activity of the biology in the soil and the, the mineralization of the soil? Really strong correlation. It's not perfect, but it's strong. So I'll give you a couple examples. Let's say that we had a, a soil biology value of 200 on the test. We just draw a line over to it and then draw one down. And that would be roughly how much nitrogen is being mineralized. And it looks like, what, 65 to 70 pounds or so of nitrogen? But that's why even if, even if you're on poor soil and, and you don't put nitrogen down, you're going to get some production, right? Because there's some natural nitrogen in that soil being released every year. That's what's going on. Um, now, what if we had something better, and this is not the best, but what if we had something that's on the healthier side of a score of 400? How much nitrogen are we mineralizing in that situation? About 165 or so, or the difference, how much extra nitrogen are we mineralizing between those two situations? About 100 units, which would be how many pounds of urea roughly? About 215 or something. What would that cost today? More than we want to know, right? More than we want to. So the next slide I show you is something Alan probably doesn't want me to show you. Um, and, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But so right now, the, you can't, he doesn't have this commercialized, this test. And if, he, and if he does, we're not going to be able to do it here at University of Kentucky. So you'd have to send it down there to get it. Uh, but what I'm going to show you next, and again, Alan will get mad if, if he knows what I'm doing here, because I'm showing you a way to get around that a little bit. But it's got to be with a big bunch of asterisks and caveats, which I will explain. So on the left is still, still that soil biological activity. But on the, on the bottom axis, I, I now have soil organic matter. Now, who here knows what their farms roughly have for soil organic matter? By the way, if I'm going to test for one thing on a standard soil test, that to me is the most important thing I want to know. What is soil organic matter in my soil? I'm not saying the other things aren't important, but I'll show you why, to me, it's the most important single number you can know on your farm. I think it actually costs six bucks. I, I'm pretty sure. Oh, something. It's not free. It, you, have to, you have to pay a lot. It's not bad, but it's well worth it. You don't have to test every year, but yeah, that's what I was thinking. At least every four or five years, I'm going to want to test for organic matter because, again, to me, that's the most important thing I want to know on my test. And I'll show you why here in a second. So look at this, uh, look at this diagram. Does it look like we have a pretty good correlation between the soil biological activity and the soil organic matter? It's not 100%, right? But it's strong. So what I'm going to do now is show you roughly what, or, what percent organic matter you'd have to have on your soil to hit those two levels of soil biological activity, the 200 level and the 400 level, just as examples. So if we had 2.5% organic matter, which I would guess would, would be not a very well-managed pasture, probably continually grazed in most cases. Um, but if anyone wants to comment on that, you, some of you have seen a whole lot more soil tests than, than I'm sure I have. But so David, what would be your guess? Two and a half percent organic matter on pasture, what kind of management would you have in that situation, long run? Because obviously, OK, so you'd agree with that. All right. Tad? That's right. We got, <laughs> sorry, we, that's fine. We got an answer. <laughs> Philip? OK. So two and a half percent. Would, would give you roughly that, that soil biological activity of 200 at the 200 level, which we saw would give you, what, about 70 pounds of end mineralization, right? 
what would it take to, to get that 400 level, about 4.5% organic matter on average, and we'll talk about the var variation, which is important. We will talk about that. So roughly, on average, 4.5% organic matter would, would give you about that 400 level biological activity that gave you how many more extra pounds of nitrogen mineralization? Gave you 100, 100 extra units, 165 total units of, of N mineralization. So in other words, increasing on average, we'll talk about the variability here in a second, but on average, if you moved long run the organic matter of your soil from 25 to 4.5%, what's the value of that to you? Can you all see what I'm getting at? Why, why to me that's the single most important number I want to see? Now, let's talk about the variability. And let me go up here. So I just kind of randomly picked th uh, roughly 3.8% organic matter, which would, what I'm trying to do is show you that within a, a particular spot, there's a wide variability of soil biological activity, right? So on the low side, it, it's just above 200. On the high side, it's what? Just above 400. Those are two values we looked at. This is one reason Alan doesn't want me to show this slide, because it varies quite a bit, right? But th I want you to think about wh what, what are the likely reasons that that varies so much? By the way, we don't know this for sure. Alan is still looking into this, but we both have our hypothesis on it. Think of some reasons why that would vary at the same organic matter. One could be soil type, but let's, which is true, but throw that out. There's some, there's some other reasons I want you to think about. All right, so when we're talking about soil organic matter, we're talking about the long-term stable component in the soils, not, not what you're maybe putting on the top. That's the long-term humic, the humus component of, of that soil. I'll agree with that. What about if you had a really heavy clover stand the last two or three years? Would that maybe make a difference in, in nitrogen mineralization? So that might be part of it. What about, what about we have two farms that started with 4% or 3.8% organic matter. One was using good grazing management, clipping weeds when they should, et cetera. The other farm went back to continuous grazing. So after three or four years, I can promise you that organic matter probably hasn't changed a lot, but would you expect maybe the biology to change in that soil? Probably so. So in other words, your management of the, the same two farms, two different management, is going to have effect on that soil biological activity. So part of it you have direct control over. Now what we don't know is exactly how much is it going to move it, but I promise you your management will shift it up or down depending on what you're doing. So you do have control over that. Now let me say one more thing. Alan didn't randomly go out and pick the farms that participate in this. It's probably like anything with extension that we do. So. Um, Tad, when you're going out looking for volunteers for experiment, are, are you just randomly going through the county and picking farmers, or are you maybe going to ones that you've worked with in the past, that sort of thing? Randomly? <laughs> Liar. <laughs> so do you all see what I'm getting at here? These are probably not average farms in here. These are probably what? These are probably some of the, the better managed grazing farms. And, and by the way, this is in three different states, North Carolina, Virginia, um, and I should know, I think West Virginia. I'll have to look that up. Um, so in other words, if we included the average farms, how do you think this would change? Would it go up or would it go down? It would go down. Now, I'm just showing, I don't know where, but it's going to probably go down. So in other words, that variability is probably bigger or, or wider than even what we're looking at here. Have you considered a regression bias? I haven't. Alan has. Yeah. So I could do that, but most people don't understand regression. So I, I like to just show visually what's going on. But yeah, he has, and it's pretty strong. Uh, he has more data now, by the way. This is a couple years old that, that I got all the data on. Um, Anyways, do you all see why long run, why, again, I, I'm not saying I don't want to know what all the other values are, but if I only had one, if I only could get one number, this is what I want to know. What's the organic matter of that soil? Which brings us to strategy number five, and, and that's, and this is a long-term component. Obviously, you're not going to change in one or two years, but long run, the, to me, the, the, best, the best insurance over high fertilizer costs is what? having high organic matter in your soil, in your pasture. 
Uh, this is, by the way, this is a farm that I've been bale grazing now for 13 years, I think, and, and that's just one component. I think it's a big component of, of why the organic matter has done so well, but it's, it's all those things we've talked about. Uh, now, it's been, I think, actually four years since I've, I've done a complete um, soil test of, of this farm, but four years ago, the average was between five and a half and five and three quarters percent organic matter on this farm. I do not know what it started with because I was like most of you. I didn't, when I started out, I didn't know you could even do organic matter. So unfortunately, I don't know what I started at. What I can tell you is my neighbors are nowhere near that. They're more in the four to, to four and a half percent range. All right. So in the, well, I want you to think about, I know we've talked about some things that some of you think may not be able to happen overnight. But think about what can you do, or let me say one more thing. The easiest place to get rid of commercial fertilizer are your pastures. Hay ground, particularly if, if you are haying off the farm that you're going to feed that hay on, you're, you're going to have to at least short term have a lot of potash on some of those farms for the, for the hay production. Um, but start with your pastures, and I think fairly easily in five years, most of us can, can either significantly reduce or completely eliminate fertilizer on the pastures. But you're going to have to go from essentially, if you're using a lot of commercial or fertilizer, you're going to have to go from essentially a chemical based fertility to a biological based fertility, which is going to take time. <clears throat> question is do I drag or harrow my pastures? This is a good question. Um, and I, all I'm going to say is I personally don't have to. But let me back up real quickly because I think this is where you're, you're probably getting at. Well, ah, it took. So remember the picture that we did bale grazing had all those pats all over. That's usually where people